We met this year at the Sustainable Living Festival when it became very clear to me that she was all about what we were on about. And I was like, well, how do you, what, what have you been up to? And she's like, oh, just writing a book on this very topic um, in England just as part of a group called uh, Revolutionising Tax and Welfare. Yeah. Yeah. And I've read a few of the sample chapters and I'm pretty excited. Um, it looks like a really interesting um, sort of explanation of uh, Georgia's economics, um, but also some really interesting ways of thinking about um, environmental taxation. Yeah. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Angela is a physicist, a lawyer, a writer, and she's going to be speaking to us tonight about astro resource rates. Um, and I think on that note, I'll just uh -huh. hand over. Thank you. Welcome. Well, um, okay. Well, um, thank you all for coming to listen, and thank you, Joseph Australia, for inviting me to talk um, today. Um, I'm not an expert in this topic. I'm an enthusiast in this topic. Okay, and um, it kind of overlaps a lot of my interests. I, mean, I have a physics degree, I'm in law, and I worked in economics. And this is one field where all of those topics kind of come together. Um, so when I was studying law, I remember going to the law library, and there was one section that didn't get any attention. It was sort of just left by itself. No one ever went there. And I remember exploring it one night, and it turned out to be where all the treaties of space and went. <laughs> I remember thinking, wow, this is an amazing topic, right? This exists, you know. But at the time, um, there wasn't much happening in the space industry, right? It was, it was something that had happened in the past. And most nations weren't putting a lot of investment into it. And certainly space law wasn't something you could study at uni. It just, you know, just wasn't. So fast forward to today, and things have changed. There's things for enthusiasts like me to talk about. I want us to look at this first, um, because I just, before we get into kind of the more mercenary side, I just want to remind ourselves and myself of what looking up at the heavens has meant to humankind, probably since time immemorial, right? It's meant wonder, it's meant curiosity, it's meant the unknown, it's meant the vastness of space that makes us feel so small. And when we get into this topic of space mining, things get real mercenary and we start talking about money. And I just think it's, it's nice to keep that in our background of our minds. This uh, little quote by um, Konstantin Soyokovsky, who was a rocket scientist, a Russian rocket scientist, really captured the ethos of what this new space race is about. This is this is the original space race, right? The one we know about. Um, of course, we've got Yuri Gagarin, we've got Neil Armstrong, and the original space race was about nation thinking. It was led by nations. Nations um, showing what they could do on the world stage for geopolitical reasons, strategic reasons, uh, scientific exploration. But also because there was a big fear that maybe the USSR would try to claim sovereignty over the moon. And there was a big fear that maybe they would try to weaponize space. The new space race is different. Okay? The new space race is led by companies, private companies. And this turns out to be quite important when you look at the law involved. And they're not going into it for the same kind of reason. They're not going into it for ge geopolitical or strategic reasons. They're going into it because they can see opportunities to make big bucks. Okay? Um, often, the promotional materials are presented in terms of democratizing space, in terms of um, down the cost of space, of getting into space. But behind all of this is the opportunity to make big bucks. And this is a quote from Peter Diamondis. Planetary resources. Um, there are $20 trillion checks up there waiting to be cashed. 
So Planetary Resources is one of the companies that's looking at, at um, space mining. So that's the kind of ethos. They see it as kind of a gold rush, gold rush type opportunity. So what are we looking at? What are they actually thinking that they can find up there? Well, um, the moon, okay? The moon has a number of things that might be relevant to people who might want to do some mining. Okay? It's got water ice. This can be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen that can be used for fuel. Uh, metals, iron, titanium, and aluminium. Helium-3 is an isotope of helium that doesn't exist on Earth and could be used for nuclear fusion reactions. And solar energy, potentially. So that's the moon. The other area that people interested in space mining are looking at are asteroids. So asteroids are space objects which orbit the sun, but which are not large enough to be considered planets. And in particular, look at near-Earth asteroids. It's about 17,000 of them. And they come within 50 million kilometers of the Earth's orbit. And asteroids can contain a wide variety of things, right? A big mix. So platinum and gold in very large deposits. Rare earth metals, okay? Metals which are hard to find in large deposits here on Earth. And often they're used in electronics, and we're kind of running out of them organic carbon, phosphorus, and water. So those kinds of materials that can support life. So there's a website, which I highly recommend for anyone uh, interested, right? And it's called Asterank, and it ranks asteroids, okay, according to various criteria, and it's extremely cool. And this is Ryugu. Ryugu is, has been ranked by Asterank as the most cost-effective to reach of all the asteroids. So they've kind of speculated, they've looked at the data, and they've come to an estimate of how much it's worth to mine, and then an estimate of how much it would cost to get there and actually conduct the mining. And they estimate that you could, you know, the whole value of, of Ryugu is 83 billion US dollars, and that you could maybe make 30 billion US dollars. <coughs> so remember that name, because that's gonna come up again later. If you said to me, okay, what's the most valuable? Don't worry about cost effectiveness and getting there and stuff. It would be this one, 511 Dabby Dab. It's got an estimated value of 100 trillion US dollars. And there are apparently about 700 asteroids in this bottom park, in this kind of ballpark. So, um, so that quote from Peter Diamond just before isn't sounding so unbelievable, right? If we, if we can get to the point where the technology would allow people would allow uh, spacecraft mining to you know, get to this kind of place, these kinds of asteroids, they could make big money, very big money. So um, this is all speculative, right? So you might say to me, well, is this really going to happen? But Goldman Sachs has recommended to their investors that they consider it. So if Goldman Sachs thinks it's serious, or at least worth considering, then probably we should also look at maybe it's worth considering. They've said, while the psychological barrier to mining asteroids is high, the actual financial and technological barriers are far lower, and the world's first millionaires will make their fortune in space. And this is a, a little bit of an infographic showing asteroid mining up to, uh, investment in asteroid mining up to 2017. So it shows the two main uh, companies that we're going to look at today. So one is Planetary Resources, the other is Moon Express. So first of all, Moon Express. These guys are the founders of Moon Express. And, the moon, ex and moon Express is obviously interested in the moon, right? In the name. So they don't call it the moon too much. They call it the Earth's eight continents. <laughs> and uh, you can see this is from their website. You've got some kids here looking up at a moon that's covered in twinkling lights, right? A totally inhabited moon. A moon that's alive with life and humans living on it. And I think the whole concept of the Earth, what Earth's 
eighth continent really kind of, it tells you a lot about how they want us to see their work, right? Um, that it's kind of like ours for the taking, just another continent on Earth, which is just lying there empty. Why don't you go get there? Why don't you go take it to horses and use it? And these are their plans, right? So they've got kind of first missions going to be like this lunar scout. It's going to ro a robotic scout that will go to the surface of the moon. Then they want to put a research outpost on the far side of the moon. And then finally, they want to bring back the rocks. And they say that this will be the first privately owned space material on Earth. That's what they say. The next one let's look at is planetary resources. Okay, so uh, Peter Diamandis and Eric Anderson have found this. You might recognize this guy, James Cameron. He's one of the investors. Uh, and the Google guys also have invested in it. So it's a bit more high profile. And this is their plan, right? And their plan involves asteroids, okay? So not the moon this time, we've got asteroids. They want to launch a rocket, little robotic spacecraft. They're gonna go up, they're each targeted to a specific asteroid, and they go and scan the surface, right? Check the surface and do spectral analysis. Then there'll be spacecraft going down and doing little probes and taking little samples, and they can send information about the samples back to Earth. So obviously, goal, locate the best mine site in the solar system. Now they don't see asteroid, they don't see asteroid mining in terms of going to an asteroid and then bringing back stuff to Earth. They see asteroid mining in terms of an outer space petrol station. Something like that. Right, so if you could, if you had some locality on an asteroid somewhere in outer space where you could provide fuel, then you could seriously reduce the cost of, of getting out of the Earth's atmosphere. The payload to get out of the atmosphere would be much lower. So it would lower the cost of space flight by a, lot, a long way. So that's their idea. And they say this, water is the oil of the solar system. Those companies who are able to harvest and harness extraterrestrial deposits of water will make Exxon look like a lemonade stand. These are some of the other you know, players, right? <clears throat> Asteroid Mining Corporation is UK based. Um, Space Resources Australia. I don't think they're doing anything much yet, but they have a website and they have some plans. So this stuff isn't just, I said it's, it's being pushed forward by private companies, but it's also being very much supported by the work of governments, right? Um, so for example, Japan is doing some good work. Now, a lot of the uh, government projects are presented in terms of um, their scientific value, their value for research and knowledge and that kind of thing. But often they will be very, very helpful to like space mining concerns. So we discussed Ryugu, right? The most cost of asteroid. Well, Japan has landed the Hayabusa 2 robotic lander on Ryugu this year after a three and a half year journey, and it's going to gather data, photos, and samples. So, obviously, that's going to be extremely useful to any asteroid mining company. They're going to know, right, what's, what's on Ryugu, what's it made of. The China National Space Administration. <coughs> Uh, they have a series of, of projects, the Chang'e projects. So in January 2019, they landed a probe on the far side of the moon. Chang'e 5 will return samples from the moon. And Chang'e 8, around 2027, will lay a groundwork for a lunar research base. The European Space Agency, they've got plans for what's called the HERA mission. Now there's a a pair of asteroids, they're twin asteroids. You've got a larger asteroid and then a smaller moon. These are called the Didymus asteroids. And the little one's called Diddy Moon, you can see right here. So their plan is to have a 
you know, again, spectral scan of Dizzy Moon and the, actually the pair of asteroids when it comes close to the Earth in 2022. And NASA are going to follow this up straight away. Straight after HERA does that, they have the double asteroid redirection test, which is amazing and scary. Right? <laughs> They're going to attempt to impact Dizzy Moon and basically knock it out of its orbit. Um, you can see why this would be useful to asteroid mining. Okay? If you can knock an asteroid into an orbit that's more convenient for mining, and you're going to save a lot of money. <coughs> so that's uh -huh. what they want to do. <laughs> that's what they want to do. But what are they allowed to do? I'm just going to have a sip of this. You know, if you, if you listen to these um, companies, you know, promotional materials, you'd think that outer space is like a lawless domain, a complete wild west, right? You can just go out there and take stuff and do what you want. But it's not the case, right? It's not the case at all. Outer space is governed by treaties. This is kind of what they want you to think it's like. <laughs> the, uh, the most famous one, the most significant one, is the Outer Space Treaty, 1967, also known as the Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration of Outer Space and the Human and Celestial Bodies, I'll just call it the Outer Space Treaty. And you can see some of these um, famous figures here signing it. And it's a high-level document. So it's not a document that goes into all the nitty-gritty. It's a document that's a high, a sort of a principal document. It's been called an ideological charter to the space age. It's a document of principle. And under international law, it's extremely strong. So it's a strong treaty because it's been ratified or acceded to, or agreed to essentially, by 107 <laughs> states, including all current spacefaring nations. This makes it a very strong binding treaty. And it's never been directly violated. This is in green are all the, are all the nations that have agreed to it. <coughs> So the key principles of the Outer Space Treaty that we for, for our they're relevant to our concerns. Article one: the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries. So that's really interesting. And in the debate around the legalities of space mining, there is debate as to what is the meaning of benefit. What is the benefit? What kind of benefit is required? Province of all mankind. That's quite ambiguous. What does it mean? Does it mean that you know humans all own it in a sense? That's ambiguous, and there's a lot of debate about that too. Out of space shall be free for exploitation and use by all states. Check forward. This one could be very significant. Outer space is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use, or by any other means. So you could take this to mean, well, you can't own private property, and no, no space uh, material can be owned, can be appropriated in any way. No homestead. No homestead, yeah, exactly. Or you could take it to mean, well, you can take resources from the moon, but you just can't claim sovereignty over the territory. It's also been put, perhaps, that it says national appropriation, right? But remember, it's not nations, per se, that are you know, planning to go up now. It's private companies. You know, and it just wasn't envisaged at the time that a private company could ever go up, do something like that. So is there a loophole there? Right? So uh, subsequent treaties try to add clarity. And the most significant is the Moon Agreement, 1979. Now, this would seem to absolutely destroy the hopes of any um, you know, space mining concerns, right? It prohibits the ownership of any extraterrestrial property by any organization or private person, unless that organization is international and government. So no organization or private person can't own 
you know, can own private property. So that would tend to kill the dreams of energy resources and moon express, don't it? And it states that the moon and natural resources are the common heritage of mankind. And this is a quite an important phrase because it's been used elsewhere, for instance, um, regarding treaties concerning the deep seabed, to basically require that any kind of mining that is done, you know, anything retrieved through mining would have to be shared as well as intellectual property, shared amongst all nations, right? So that would imply that maybe that's what would be required, right? And it proposes the establishment of an international regime to govern the exploitation of such resources when feasible. So it's not just private companies going up and doing their own thing. It should be governed by an international body, according to the Moon Agreement. But the Moon Agreement has a big problem. It's not ratified by any spacefaring nations, and only 18 nations are parties to it. You can see here in green, we've got the parties to it. So, under international law, this is a very, very weak treaty and possibly a failed treaty, right? And the US are adamant that it is not binding at all, okay? Not binding on them, not binding at all, absolutely not. Outer space is not a global commons. Nor the common heritage of mankind, not rest on this, nor is it a public good. This concept is not part of the outer space treaty. And the United States has consistently taken the position that these ideas do not describe the legal status of outer space. And that is Dr. Scott Pace, the Executive Secretary of the U.S. National Space Council, being very, very emphatic. So what has happened, you could say, in uh, this, this discussion, in the legal discussion, in the political discussion, is kind of a predictable kind of divide. You have developed nations, basically the US, but developed nations, space-faring nations, adamant that the Moon Agreement is not binding. Right? No Moon Agreement. The benefits that they talk about in the Outer Space Treaty, that's just if companies go up there and bring stuff down, that's your benefit. Right? That's your benefit. There's no other, there's no more direct benefit. I'm calling it a trickle-down benefit. They would maybe call it that. But they're suggesting that just by bringing down the materials and selling it, that's going to be the benefit. Common heritage means all have access. So all nations have the right to go up there and take stuff. <laughs> Not they're all entitled to a share. Right? But they're quite emphatic about that too. And then they say, hey, this is a high risk area. Right? This is a high risk enterprise. We can't afford added, the added burden of of profit sharing or any of the other ideas that you guys have, we are bearing all the risk, okay? On the other hand, okay, you have this poorer, less developed, non space frame nation. They say, yes, the moon agreement is binding, and yes, it's relevant, and it's good law. They say the benefit mentioned in the Outer Space Treaty means a real and direct benefit. Not just, you know, you bring down the stuff and we buy it, or we will buy it. Common heritage means share the wealth and share the intellectual property as well. And you guys can't just go up there piecemeal, right? You can't just send companies up there. Space resources must be managed by an international body. So this is the divide that is appearing in the discussion. And it's almost like a stalemate, really. And this is a, a quote from the former editor general of Space Law, basically saying, look, we need supportive political action here because the law is not telling us anything that we can use now. Space lawyers are reduced to arguing the number of angles that can fit on the head of the pen. <laughs> this is just pointless, right? Take action. Action needs to be taken. Right? And the US has done that, but maybe not in the best way possible. So the U.S. is going it alone in 2015, the Commercial Space Launch and Competitiveness Act. Obama signed up. And they're kind of trying to have it both ways, basically. Um, 
it reports to grant US companies ownership of anything they bring back to the space. Okay, so, you know, uh, planetary resources can go up to an asteroid, can mine it, can bring back the stuff, they own it. And it maintains that the US does not exert sovereignty over the celestial bodies themselves. So that's how it's trying to be consistent with the outer space treaty. And this legislation has been copied by Luxembourg as well. And, you know, some of these, uh, these companies are you know, lobbying their governments to do the same. So, for instance, um, asteroid mining companies are trying to lobby the UK government for similar legislation. But this is a worry, right? This idea of countries just kind of legislating their own jurisdictions, the companies with their own jurisdictions, this is not Space lawyer Michael Lipsner, China, things start getting dicey, that could lead to legal and political conflict. So we'll have a piecemeal regime where you know, the governments of different countries will, will create legislation for their own, their own companies. So this is kind of where I want you, know, you guys to start thinking, right? To, because we're going to need to get creative right, to get somewhere. And I'm suggesting some requirements for a model some kind of model that will bridge this divide, okay, that will um, create a workable project for the future. I'm suggesting that the benefit should be a tangible one. So no trickle down benefit. Benefit should be tangible and it should be a tangible one for all nations. It should anticipate and avoid future potential conflicts. So it should be joined up in such a way that it deals with possible conflicts over resources. It should avoid resource hoarding and market speculations. Um, I mention this because there's been some problems around um, satellite orbits uh, associated with this problem. So we want to avoid that. Nations, companies should have an interest in adhering to it. It should be something they, they, they have a reason to adhere to. It, it should solve a salient problem if that's going on. It should be flexible because we are, because it's an emerging field and we don't quite know where it's going to go yet. It should avoid fears of a world government. Now this one seems a bit funny, maybe a bit paranoid, right? But um, I put that one in because I have been to space conferences and I've spoken to some of the people that you know are working in these companies or are founders of various companies. And when I proposed some kind of model that would um, that would you know, benefit all of humanity, I always get this response. No, 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 no taxation. We won't accept any taxation because we do not want a world government. That's a serious fear, especially for American people that I've met. So I think we should try and avoid that, especially since it's the Americans living in Europe. Like and it shouldn't discourage commercial ventures. Right? Now, we might want this to happen, we might not want this to happen. But if, we, if we're okay with it happening, our system shouldn't make it impossible. Right? Our system shouldn't be unnecessarily unwieldy and prevent the kind of innovation that's required. And this is a good quote, which I think was really beautifully put, right? For those pioneers who take upon themselves the risk of failure, where multi-billion dollar investments may burn on the launch pad or drift helplessly <laughs> into the vastness of outer space. This is actually a SpaceX rocket, um, which in 2017 exploded on the launch pad. And it contained Facebook's satellite, and it was worth a lot of money. Aww. It just went down like that. Like. So it is a high risk area. So I'm going to propose two models, which I think both um, both address all of those um, points that I've just made. This one um, is by Professor Saletta and Orman Rossiter from the University of Melbourne. And it's based on the Alaska Permanent Fund. So basically, the Alaska Permanent Fund was created when they discovered oil right, in Alaska. <laughs> And they created this fund from the returns, I think 25% of the oil returns went into the fund. 
And it's just continued year on year on year. And every year, all the citizens of Alaska receive a dividend. And this is actually a big deal for Alaska. It's kind of a big celebration. You know, they find out how much the dividend's going to be. And they end up with a personal stake in the resources of Alaska, a personal stake in the fund. Um, and it's been a very robust fund. Over the years, there's been efforts to you know, try and divert the money to this and that, but absolutely Alaskans are not having it, right? So this is, a, this is something which is, has been a benefit to Alaska. And it's allowed them to have a dividend, each, each person to have a dividend every year. <clears throat> So Saleta and Norman Rossiter think we could do a similar thing with space resources. So their model goes like this. We establish an international organization, possibly under the World Bank, which has the right to lease extraterrestrial sites of resource extraction. This organization can impose royalties on production. The royalties go into an international space resource fund whose dividends could then be distributed. And this distribution would go to national governments, either based on population size, or it could be distributed by a mix of monetary and non-monetary benefits, or individual payments to every person in the world in the form of a worldwide citizen's dividend. So anyone who's interested in basic income will see how this could be quite interesting. So I really like that model, but my only worry is whether or not um, companies would agree to it, right? Because I suspect they won't want, they'll say they can't, they can't bear the weight of royalties on production and licensing, right? That's my suspicion. So inspired by Henry George, I was thinking about how maybe George's ideas could give us a more a, a different kind of model. Okay. So um, I'm here at Prosper Australia, and most of you people and know Henry George inside and out to a degree that's far more advanced than myself. But some of you won't, so I'm going to give a little background of the people. This is also Henry George right here. <laughs> So Henry George was a 19th century economist and land reformer. And he was also a journalist, he was a writer, he was kind of a man of the people, he wasn't an activist of an academic type. And he said this, when natural resources are abundant, people may take as they please. So we can breathe in the air, we can all breathe as much air as we like, there's no competition over it, it's totally abundant. When resources are scarce, all have equal claim to them, so, or in practice, to a share of their value or proceeds. And a good example is land. Land is scarce. So what is that value? What are these proceeds? The value is the rent as judged by the market, and it only arises when there's competition over that resource. So where there's no competition, there's no value, there's no rent. Where there is competition, value is created, right? Market value is created. So I have been thinking about how these basic tenets could be applied in the outer space context. So outer space, well, obviously outer space is infinite or it's expanding, right? So we're told by the physicists and scientists. But the outer space bodies that are realistically accessible are scarce. So we all have a claim to a share of their resources. What's the value? The value is the rent as determined by the market. And of course, it's only generated, as I said, when more than one party seeks to obtain the same resource. It only happens when there's competition. So I'm suggesting that maybe when more than one company wants to mine on the same area for an, uh, excuse me, the same area on an asteroid, would be one example, right? We'd have competition over that area or that resource. So perhaps what could happen is, in practice, companies would bid over the right to access a certain area or resource, and this could be overseen by an international body such as the UN. 
and those monies likewise could be put into a fund, distributed as a dividend, etc., etc. This is a much more limited role, right? What's the advantages of this model compared to the other ones, possibly? It can't discourage investment in space. Since the rent is determined by how much the market itself is willing to pay, there can be no argument that the framework will discourage enterprise. It's not an external body imposing a tax, a fee, or anything else. It's what players in the market themselves are willing to bid. It's a limited role, it's a useful role. Nations or companies are more likely to cooperate with a scheme whose role is limited to resolving through auction disputes over resources, a salient problem which they might have in the future, a salient and possibly expensive problem. Both of the proposals I've mentioned would allow for the orderly and fair use of out of space resources. Both would directly benefit mankind in accordance with the out of space treaty. Both reflect the communitarian ethos of the moon agreement, right? The idea that it is our common heritage, our problem. Both may even encourage investment in space mining by providing an internationally agreed upon framework by which companies may access space resources and be said to own them so they can feel certain that what they have is their private property. And it won't stop the stratospheric profits that companies want to make. It's not going to interfere with that. And it will avoid future conflicts over space resources, or help to prevent that anyway. Maybe not totally at all, but help to prevent I want to, I guess, sound a slight warning, using this quote, which I think is quite amazing, from scholar Carol Buxton. She says, man, like the universe, follows a pattern, one of acquisitive need and selfish procurement. Ancient man first fought over Earth's resources, then the land itself, when occupation became feasible. To the dismay of less developed nations, this cycle will continue in place, as man exploits celestial resources and later develops the ability to occupy celestial bodies. So that's kind of, uh, well, I don't take that as a statement of what must happen. I take that as a warning of what might happen, of the way that we might go, but we don't have to go that way. Um, outer space has always been the site of the idealist. We think about H.G. Wells, we think about Jules Verne, we think about the man on the moon. These are impossible ideas, but they came true. So I think that some kind of model for space resource use, which benefits all of humanity, is possible. And that's what I want to have you. Thank you. I just have a quick question first. Um, <clears throat> from the outer space treaty, what are they actually defining as uh, outer space? Like, what, what's the limitation of? Mm -hmm. Is it the end of our atmosphere? Is it? Um, that's yeah, that's what I was very curious. Probably a hundred uh, kilometers up. Yeah. No. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm supposed to say. <laughs> uh, I believe the outer space treaty pertains to all celestial bodies, outer space bodies. I would have to double check exact wording, but it's not limited to, you know, our atmosphere or anything like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, potential bodies. What I just find interesting is all the satellite things of you know, what's happening up there with space trash, things like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, you know, with America's complete militaristic attitude towards um, inner space, still atmospheric space, which is something to have this outer space treaty. It doesn't really seem to define it, say, like international waters. It's like five miles off the shore, yeah. you're now in international waters and subject to international law. So I find it really interesting that it's kind of ambiguous. To, mm. There's no clear law. It's the whole thing of it being a high level principle document. Mm. And it was never anticipated as being kind of the answer to all of the questions. It was, it was supposed to be the start, and the others would follow. But kind of what seems to have happened is that they've had trouble getting these subsequent treaties to be adhered to or, or, or agreed to. Right? So the Moon Agreement, for example, not being um, ratified by very many, well, not being ratified by any space very nations. So yeah, that is part of the problem with it. It's a high level principle document that doesn't give that detail and we're gonna need that.
So building on the idea that the OST was a high level principle document, it seems to me that you've drawn a dichotomy between spacefaring nations and other non spacefaring nations who have divergent <laughs> interests in what type of claim they can make on space. But what seems to me you're not speaking to the different legal frameworks about property and so when you were talking like the concept of usufruct, you know, the right, you know, the common right to use something, you know, for welfare and well-being wasn't really addressed. And it seems like there's different systems of property rights and the origins of property rights within the various spacefaring nations, which may inform different approaches to fleshing out the space treaty. Can you talk to that? Um, I haven't actually thought on that too deeply, you're right. Um, I guess it's that I, it, it sort of, that adds to my concern over the idea of there being piecemeal arrangements, you know, um, when you have different concepts of property being used. Um, that would suggest there is a need for some kind of regime that everybody's agreed to. So I guess my question speaks to the implications that are terrestrial that may be more pressing than the implications that are extraterrestrial. No doubt. No doubt about it. Go on. What are those implications? Oh, well, yeah, I, I, can anyone answer it? I mean, it seems like in the different, like in what the Chinese concept of common law known that's outside of property, you know, what's the non Roman concept, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, each different country will have different sounds just like what the space lobbyists, the space miners will be proposing in a couple of years once they've got this on to how valuable it is. International agreements are virtually impossible these days, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Whatever format. So at least we have some broad brush stroke and broad brush document there. But yeah, you do wonder how any property rights or sharing of those property rights would be enforced. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, as a real estate, ex real estate value manager, um, I used to value going concerns, such as a hotel, mm -hmm. nursing home, or a restaurant. And the commonly accepted thing for that was, as between the uh, landlord and the tenant, you'd split the net profits, earnings before income tax depreciation, amortisation for 50 50. That was actually almost the plan put up for the RSPT, the Resort Super Profits Tax, that went down to them. But that's got advantages because if if you blow up on the launch pad, well, it's not going to be any net profits. And and, and uh, obviously, I like the second model about the royalties because royalties are arbitrary and they usually pitch down there. Whereas this, well, well, as of Georgia, so I think the right one would be a 50% interest between the Landlord, the earth, earthlings, and and the tenants of the operators. So, so we're the landlords. We, of course, we are. We, oh, we're, 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 we're just agreed under, under the outer space agreement that we're all we're the landlords. Yeah. So when you say a fifty percent split, what are we? Are we splitting the rent? We're splitting, no, we're splitting the net profit. Oh, net profit. Earnings oh, 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 before income tax and depreciation and amortisation. Oh, okay. And that the RSPC was going to go forty forty percent and. Uh, but there's a principle behind that which is accepted in valuation. And, you know, the valuer does this and he sets the rent. He looks at all the profit losses for several years, what's the history. You take out the uh, non recurring expenditures and come to a common thing and you say, well, yeah, well, should be able to maintain X rent. Um, I like the idea of obviously people bidding, bidding for it too, and that's why. The second model is going to be royalties, but but this third model is going to look going for it, where you knew, you know earnings before um, earnings before income tax depreciation and amortisation 50-50. But that's not what you're going to get. You're going to get that something. I, I'm I'm pretty despondent like that last quote you put up there. I think uh, I think the company is going to ride roughshod. That's that's the way we are. Mm. It depends whether they. I think like I don't know, speak realist hat on, I think it will depend upon in whose interest space can be secured. Mm. And the militarization problem is not um, 
separate to the property problem. Like, yeah, I mean, you're, you're probably right, you're only as good as your capacity to either, you know, get an agreement with others who might have different ideas about property rights or you know, size of your stick. <laughs> so, the finding is the landlords would not would work well until there was that commercial civilization involved. Yeah, I was going to say that. That's why they might dispute our, our landlords. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah then, then, then where do you draw the line on the map? <laughs> um, I think that would be an amusing point. The mark point is if you accept a commercial lease, <laughs> and you know that's accepted in commercial, yeah. uh, everyone does it. Yeah, but you can't accept it quite to. Uh, to Jim and Reinhardt, you know, which it should have been, but they just spent, what was it, 22 million against the whole setup, so they put this pretty well on that. that mean, but it, yet in all other commercial areas it works, but you can't get into mining, and that's getting very close to the situation we're talking about. The interests seem to have a habit of playing certain property rights themselves. Yeah, yeah. On that topic of the militarization side of it, um, uh, Peter and I were talking about about the fact that the relationship that companies have towards their governments in the US is not the same as in, in for example, China. Um, and that is a consideration which I haven't really thought too deeply about, like what would that, what might that mean? Um, also, I, I was recently reading that um, there's a quote from someone from the Chinese uh, space agency, and it was about going to the moon. It basically sort of said, we have to go to the moon because if we don't go to the moon now, we might not be able to later. Like somebody might stop us later. And it's a bit like these islands. So you know the islands that, that China is, is kind of yeah, in control of. They, 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 he, this a representative from the Chinese Space Agency drew a direct analogy um, between those islands and you know, the moon and things like that. So very much think of it in terms of strategic you know, game. So, yeah. so that is another consideration. Mm. Sorry, yeah. So um, you're very well versed on the whole space thing. We've got the comments and such. And you brought up a good point. It's like in all of these conversations about space law, is there any point where we are actually recognizing that we there are possibly extraterrestrial civilizations out there? And where do they fit in the scope of all of these treaties and such? And what are we even thinking about that when we're discussing space? In the conferences, I can't say that they ever talk about it too much, the ones I've been doing. Yep. But um, there is, I, I would have to double check, but I believe in that United States Competitiveness Act, uh, the Space Competitiveness Act, uh, I do believe there are some provisions which prevent the private ownership of any life form, something like that. So it is kind of, I would have to double check exactly what it, what it said, but I do believe it has mentioned something like that. Vision for not owning a life form. That wouldn't count as private property, property. If, if they found that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, obviously, uh, yeah, sorry, anything on the, if that wasn't clear, um, anything on us. You can't have a pet island. Oh. What? My dream. I would have to yeah. check that though. Not bring a pet dog to face. <laughs> I just find it kind of weird, like how yeah. like all this talent power race has such like colonial underpinnings. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so, oh my goodness. Very similar to the colonial companies that you know yeah. they had a trading company. Yeah. Yeah. So you envision all these assets only being used as a fuel stop to being used further on, or it's someone actually bring it back through the atmosphere back to Earth? I think that. Well, according to what I've read, I mean, it would only be if there were really uh, big chunks of gold or platinum or something like yeah. that, like huge chunks that might be worth bringing back to Earth. Yeah. And then there's also the consideration of what that would do to the on-Earth market for that yeah. thing. Wow. If you water that thing down in huge amounts, could you yeah. control that somehow so it didn't crush the market? Yeah. So there has been discussion of that, but yeah, I think most of these, in the asteroid case, yeah. Most most of the thinking of, of, of outer space. But so see that I didn't really see there'll be some demand to you know use it as a fuel stop to go further out. But then there's the Neil deGrasse and Tyson, which we talked about, um, yeah. principle that there may not necessarily be that much demand for people to move on to any other planet. Because we all think, oh, we're gonna stuff up the Earth so bad and one day we might want to move to Mars or move to another planet. But Neil deGrasse and Tyson's view is that that will never happen because 
the amount of like resources and the amount of just technology that would be involved in say going to Mars, making it an atmosphere that we could actually work with and actually plant we could actually live on, that is so much greater than the technology it would take to actually just fix up Earth. <laughs> that that would never actually happen. And, and no matter how shit Earth gets, it will yep. never be as shit as Mars. So, Angela, my question uh, was regarding the value of the resources. And if they're making those statements that uh, there's so much of it's world out there, how's that world going to be realised and not brought back to Earth? I think, uh, well, from what I've gathered, they're they're anticipating an explosion of, of the space industry. Do you know what I mean? So there'll be um, more and more need to go into deeper space and that kind of thing. So that seems to be the plan. I, I don't see how it could work without that as an outer space petrol station. Um, so they see themselves as being part of that. Um, and 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 it, it does. I didn't you know discuss in too much detail, but it does go alongside with this idea that there will be some form of inhabitation, inhabitating of the, of the moon and other you know, potentially asteroids and things like that. Human habitation, I mean. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And what, what are the, some of the more valuable resources that are out there that lead to such huge uh, projections in the um, Huge deposits of platinum and gold. Um, and also those rare earth metals um coltane sorry coltane you know that one the so-called rare earth metals aren't they really it's just the process used to get them out for which it's used right so that's the fusion i guess it's like you do it up there and stuff like that mm -hmm. i think i i i my understanding was that they're, they're not rare but they're distributed in uh sort of thinly around the earth's crust mm -hmm. in a way that's not um, amenable to sort of mining. They're available in sort of big deposits mm -hmm. on these asteroids. I've been thinking about this rare earth thing. Oh, sorry, Bruce. Okay. Go on. Uh, it's a bit of a departure from rare earths, but if we think about Musk's million man or million person city on Mars, yeah. <laughs> uh, and you're saying with the Georgia's model that everyone owns the eighth, ninth continent, um, but what about those million people who are on Mars? Yeah. Don't they have special rights to the resources that they're sharing mm -hmm. as inhabitants of that planet? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe there'll be some kind of Mars Earth kind mm -hmm. of, you know, rivalry or what fight there. I, I don't I don't and know. Maybe yeah, income income tax on them, really. No, no maybe yeah. things are just so sweet for them that they don't ever want to rock the boat. I feel like Mars is going to be highly dependent on us. For a while, yeah. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. they'd have really little resilience. <laughs> I mean, not both. Just coming back to the um, resource <coughs> exploitation side of things. Yeah. Has there been any serious feasibility studies on what it would, uh, you know, return a potential return for actually mining and physically bringing that back to Earth? Um, I mean, unless you inhabit these yeah. places and use it locally. It seems to me it would be uh, just totally prohibited. Yeah. It's, I, I would thought so. It's still very speculative, like wi wildly speculative in, mm. um, in terms of estimating the cost of that. But I think mm. they're trying to. Mm. So just connecting to how speculative it is with the idea you're talking about. Um, value of rental. I'm not very familiar with George's idea, so it just struck me that I'm not sure how the value of what how George talks about uncertainty and information he seems to say that a rent is generated when there's competition but I'm not sure that it necessarily speaks about how information contributes to the generation of that value it seems that in space we have space exploration we have massive speculation which means that we have poor information which means we've got really high uncertainty which means that the values really have to be very very unstable how does George talk about information? Yeah, look, in this situation, I don't think he did. That's why that third model was very good. The, the cost would be prohibitive. And if you're talking about net profit, you, you know, uh, before income tax, that would be zero net profit for years and years and years. So, but 
but that's the problem also with the um, <coughs> uh, the first and second models. How do how, how, how you set your what's the first model? The, um, the, the Alaska type model, yeah. How do, you, yeah how, do, how do you set the return on that, or how do you set the rent of the second model? And the third model, if it's, if it's for net, net profit mm. uh, before income tax, there will be no net profit because they're massive. But once it became profitable, uh, that's where Earth gets a, should have a 50%. But what about share. on the planet Earth? When George proposed that people uh, you know, coming into competition for localized, there was a localized there was there, wasn't there? How much competition needs to be to get an efficient market? Not much, but you still say that any time a community comes together, they always play with the work for others. We haven't got that situation on the, on the planet, so that's what I think. Due to the end of the design. Say hello, George. Well, 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 watching well. it harder. Yeah. There is people, we've received messages saying, can you angle the screen? Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> See Angela. Maybe we should turn it off, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks guys. We'll see you in space. <laughs>